Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Will Zermino of Zermino Knives. I first met Will and checked out his work at Blade Show 2022, where that year he won Best Tactical Folder. I met him again in Conroe at the Texas Custom Knife Show this past November, where I got a second look at his knives, uh, which are super stout and super sturdy, and I knew I wanted to find out more. Uh, He served many years in law enforcement, where he no doubt learned the value of a good blade, but what accounts for the artistry in his tactical folders? We'll dig in and find out, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download us wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to help support the show, uh, you can do so by going to Patreon and checking out what we have to offer there. Quickest way to do that is to scan the QR code right there on your screen or head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. Hey, good to have you here, Will. Thank you, sir. It's good to have Will Zermino of Zermino Knives. Uh, it's it's cool because when I first met you and uh, first saw your work at 2022 Blade Show, um, I had never heard of you before and hadn't seen your work. But that that's not crazy because uh, I wasn't really into tactical folders at that moment. Uh, but then I saw that you won Best Tactical Folder. I paid a little bit more attention. And then when I saw you in Conroe, uh, I, just, I just thought uh, your knives are pretty pretty right up my alley and a lot of my viewers also know your work so uh, i'm I'm really happy to have you here congratulations be it belated on that uh, best tactical folder thank you sir oh yeah i mean how did that feel Uh, it was pretty nice it was um a little unexpected but yeah it was it was the uh knife makers guild best tactical folder not the actual blade show one Oh, so actually, coming from the Knife Makers Guild, it's almost a, um, in a in a sense, a more coveted kind of thing because it's your peers judging you, not necessarily knife enthusiasts like myself or those who run uh, Blade Magazine, but other people who make knives. Yes, it's judged by the guild. All right, so just so people uh, know what we're talking about, you have any knives around you right in front of you you could show off? Like maybe uh, the yes. one that won Best Tactical. Uh, I don't have it, but it's going to be a version of it. Oh, yeah. It's uh, about, about eight and a half inches long overall. The uh, frame is uh, 160 thick titanium, and the blade is 3 sixteenths. So uh, what is that called? Tier, T-Y-R. T-Y-R. All right, you had that on your business card with some Mokutai and some some fanciness, uh, some sort of a blue. Well, I have it around here somewhere. But um, in other words, uh, it, it what I'm getting at is when you look at that knife and when you pick it up and heft it, it's a sturdy, heavy-duty, hard-use tactical folder uh, but the way it's treated, the details and such, uh, you give it a lot of extra. Uh, what is what is your tell us like your overriding philosophy on on knives and and what you're going for? Mostly nowadays, I make what I like, and I'm I'm more into the big overbuilt knives. Um, that's pretty much the re- what I do now. Okay, so you're making big, overbuilt, over, uh, not overbuilt, but uh, hard use knives. Why? What, like, why those and why not slip joints or anything else? Uh, uh, Mainly because I like them. I I am looking at doing a slip joint later just to try it, just to, you know, to see how it works and just because I've never done one. But at the moment, 
I do these because they sell pretty well. And, and that's pretty much the kind of knife I like. So uh, I mentioned up front that you spent a long time in law enforcement and uh, uh, I'm making assumptions there, but uh, in that line of work, I would imagine knives come in handy a lot for pretty much a lot of different aspects of that kind of job, whether you're uh, at the scene of a traffic accident or whether you're, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, it seems like uh, knives and law enforcement go together. Uh, tell me, uh, tell us about your law enforcement past and uh, how that how that fed into your knives. Um, I worked for the sheriff's office in Harris County for just shy of 32 years. Uh, the last 20 years that I worked there, I was an accident reconstructionist, hmm. um, which basically I was one of the people that came out and, and uh, if someone was killed in an accident, tried to ascertain what had occurred. Well, so uh, tell me about that work. I mean, what's what's that what's that like? I mean, it seems like that's the sort of thing you come to only after years of doing law enforcement work. It doesn't seem like the sort of job you just enter into from the beginning because it seems like you might be taking a lot of experience and seeing those kind of things uh, before you're actually reconstructing accidents. What was that like? It's one of the jobs where they require more training and it's kind of, um, not everybody likes it. Uh, a lot of people don't uh, really respond well to seeing bodies that have been torn up in a crash. So there weren't a whole lot of us. And most of us that got into it pretty much stayed there. It was somebody that, that enjoyed the work and, uh, also usually was fairly good with math because we used that a lot. So math, that might be uh, something that carries over into your, into your work right now. Uh, but, but before we get to that, is it like puzzle or is it like putting together a puzzle, trying to figure out what happened in an accident? Uh, yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll gather, the, you'll gather the roadway evidence, uh, you know, from skid marks, yaw marks, uh, crushed, uh, crushed damage to the vehicles, and they'll use that to reconstruct what had happened, how fast the vehicles were going, and and to, to ascertain who was responsible for the crash. Okay, so before we move on from that, because I, I I think it's pretty interesting, and actually uh, I've done some work with our, our local uh, police here, and one time I got a chance to see the lot where they hold all the cars that are being investigated or uh, have been in crashes, and man, it's... Uh, it's very alarming and it gives you a, a new respect for that uh that bomber yeah you know, that that bomb you're riding around in all day um but uh what i wanted to uh oh why was i saying that oh well because uh when i went there there was a lot of knife usage uh that i saw and maybe some of it was playing for the camera uh, but they were using knives to cut seat belts. They were using knives to cut tires. They were using knives, uh, the glass breakers to, uh, there was a lot of kind of showing off of tools and knives were, uh, I, well, that's what I was looking for. They played heavily. Uh, how did you, uh, how did you in your job uh, come to knives or have you always been like a knife guy and it just sort of was part of your job? I've always been pretty much a knife guy. Um, strangely enough, the knife that I use most while I worked there doing that was actually a Leatherman because you had, you know, if you needed to disconnect something or pull fuses, you'd have, you'd be able to do that and you'd still have a knife. So I'm sure you saw lots of grizzly things. A lot of first responders do, uh, but, before we move on from this, I have to ask you, I ask a lot of service members and police officers this, like, what was the weirdest thing you saw, the strangest, most uncanny thing you saw in that job? Uh, maybe something that defied explanation. was expecting that question. <laughs> you can answer it at the end of the show, but I'm, I'm always okay. interested because uh, I, I find that law enforcement 
first responders and truck drivers have to see weird stuff. <laughs> and it's always interesting to me. Um, so the folders now, the knives, how did it come to pass that you started making them? Obviously, well, you said you've always been a, a knife guy. You worked in a profession where they came in handy at, at, at least. How did you get into making them? I had a couple of custom folders made and I decided it would be kind of good to try it myself. And that was about 2007. And uh, I tore up a lot of nice steel before I got where I could even make a halfway decent knife. So it was kind tell of a trial about, and error. So tell me first about this uh, custom uh, that you had, you commissioned, you had a, another maker. Um, yeah, I went to a, uh, somebody and had some made. Uh, I've also carried knives in the past. Like I was kind of fond of the Striders because I really liked that big folder. So that's one of the things kind of led me to try to make my own. And I pretty much went with the overbuilt size. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm a sucker for the overbuilt. What, what was, uh, what was the experience like? And I, I asked this uh, partly out of uh, uh, personal interest because this past year I, had my first design made uh, we made 20 we he made 27 of them and uh and sold most of them and kept a couple for friends and family but uh it was a very interesting experience and it's a guy that who's already a buddy of mine um but uh creative collaborations are always interesting what was it like for you especially being your first uh experience making uh, having one of your designs made in a way a little stressful because you know you got two people competing on what they want to do um you know you'll have ideas and and sometimes your ideas are honestly terrible <laughs> <laughs> so you you'll come up with something and they're kind of like no that 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 really won't work you find that frustrating uh, a little bit but i mean as you go on you start learning what you were you know what you were asking, which parts of it would work, which parts of it wouldn't. And right. Right. I've, I've heard that from people who have, uh, well now you're on the other side of it cause you're making the knives, but I've, I've heard that from people who, uh, work with OEMs overseas and uh, they send a design and they really love this design and they think that it's the perfect design and then they get it back and it, things are changed because of the engineering. Um, mm -hmm. whether it's a, difficulty in making it or uh, or or the actual configuration design is flawed for three-dimensional uh production uh, but i I, th I find that interesting because that's that is collaboration you got someone creative saying this is a great idea let's do this and then you have the realistic person saying uh, it won't work like that because of physics on our planet that's absolutely true well, so then how did you dive into the, the making part yourself? Have you always been a handy guy? Um, yeah, sort of, but pretty much I bought a KMG grinder and uh, a bunch of steel and I went to tearing it up and making it into powder. The first ones were absolutely awful. And since then it's progressively gotten better. Well, what were the first ones like? Uh, paint a picture for us. Um, the fit finish was terrible. Nothing was countersunk. Um, I hadn't really figured out lock geometry at the time because I stupidly thought, let me go make a folder first. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You started with folders. I made the assumption. Terrible decision. <laughs> I've told people that, you know, that make knives occasionally, you know, fixed blades that were like, what's something I should know? And I said, there has to be a certain level of self-hatred when you first start out because you're not going to be happy. Especially if you're some sort of a, a knife enthusiast and you pour over other people's work and, and, you know, it's going to drive you nuts when you start making your own. Yeah, because it did. Would you have something in your your head? But when you start doing it for the first time, it doesn't turn out anything like what you picture. 
So this is about 2007, I think. Yeah, I, I around 2007 was when I started making it. So now, how did you approach this? Did you seek out other makers? Did you, was YouTube much of a thing even? No, a lot of it was uh, the internet, uh, like the usual suspect forums. They, they have like a, a steel dust junkie section in there, blade forums. And um, Bob Trezula's book, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, uh, The Tactical Folder. Yeah. That was... I couldn't have done anything without that. That's cool. Yeah, he's uh, the godfather of tactical folders. That is a that's a great book to just look through. Um, uh, we gave that book and and a uh, Terzuola, um, uh, what do you call it, production folder here a couple of uh, years ago. We gave that away, and I looked through that book. And you don't have to be a maker to appreciate it. Uh, it's really cool to see no oh, yeah yeah it's an excellent book so his his model was part of what um kind of what kind of got you to uh get your craft in order is that right yeah i mean you're looking through his book figuring out what you're screwing up and you're trying to you know figure out what you need to do to make it a functional life so, uh, what, okay, I think you and I are probably about the same age. I think you and I are about the same age, just from reading your bio and stuff. Uh, and so this is a pointed question to sort of pat our generation on the back. So help me out here. But um, so you were actually reading a book. You were doing this all by looking at books. Uh, maybe a little bit of internet here and there. Uh, but how amazing is it that, that we all now, if we want to start doing anything, making anything, doing anything, uh, can go to YouTube right here um, and look it up. Do you think that would have been helpful uh, when you were cutting your teeth? Yeah, it really, really would have. YouTube has got some great source material now for on how to do things. So, all right, let's let's find out your process. Um, uh, tell us how you go about making a folder and what your um, you know, how, how you, well, how you do it. I pretty much design everything in CAD. And the main reason is I can't draw. I mean, it, it, it looks like a child with a crayon if you try to get me to draw something. So I pretty much do everything in CAD. And what I did initially was I would print it out on paper, lay it out on the piece of steel and titanium and drill it out and start shaping it, you know, off of the, the paper. Now, pretty much everything I do, I do it in CAD. I'll have a water jetted out and uh, sent back to me. What's it like creating in CAD? Is that a, is that a part of the process you, you can lose yourself in? Um, where I assume that grinding is probably that kind of a process. Uh, yeah, it, it really is. I, I enjoyed the CAD part and I've enjoyed how to, try to learn how to do uh, uh, machining in it, you know, tool paths, which is still something I am not that great at. Um, but yeah. Um, so uh, with, with the CAD, what was the, what was the learning curve like on that? Uh, the first CAD program I used actually the learning curve wasn't that bad. Learning curve wasn't that bad. I think I started out with auto sketch. Um, the one I'm using now is Fusion 360, and the learning curve fit was a little bit bigger, higher, but I'm starting to get the hang of it now. I, I, I can 2D draw out whatever I want. I can 3D draw it. Just getting to the point of doing tool pass is still the biggest thing I haven't learned. Do, wait, doing what? Tool, tool paths. Pass? Yeah. Oh, tool paths. Okay. Oh, so sorry. you're... You, no, no, no. I, I, I misheard. So you're when you're designing the knife, you're you're designing its contours, its its outlines, and its surfaces, and then programming tool passes. Is that how it's all carved out? For most of my folders, they're completely hand done. I have a couple of them that are done with CNC, but like ninety percent of them are all hand done. Most of the things I'm doing right now with uh, with uh, CNC is mostly done just just doing the handles like uh the handle on this that was all 
basically done on the CNC. Oh, that is so cool. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Don't put that away. Hold that up. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is so cool. And, and, and anyone who knows me will know that this is right up my alley. Uh, knuckle duster, sort of trench knife style knife. Now, this is this is not your uh, usual bread and butter. Um, tell us, I mean, you, you mostly make hard use folding knives, but yeah, uh, things, things like this trench dagger or, uh, the, the EDC fix blade that's, uh, on your, uh, Instagram page a lot. Uh, what's it like going between those two worlds? They seem very different. The folders are actually, I do probably 90% folders. Mm -hmm. And it to me it's in a way actually easier because I I do them in batches and let's say like you know the tier I may do four or five of them at one time so I'm just used to doing those. So this okay so here's your Instagram page I I really like that uh, I keep coming back to that EDC fix blade because I'm a big uh, I, I love yeah, EDC I think I still fix blade. Actually have that one because we hadn't went to a show yet but yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is that? Uh, tell us about that model. It's about seven and a half inches long overall. Uh, this one's nitro V steel. It's three sixteenths thick. Uh, the screws on it are titanium from a tie connector and the wood. I cannot even pronounce what they call it. Uh, oh, wait, you got to hold it up. So we can... Oh, okay. Hey, sorry. Hold, yeah. Hold it up. So we... oh, look at that. That is a beauty. And that handle looks great, too. I mean, it looks like something that's uh, really going to melt in the hand. You'll have a lot of control over. But it looks like a decent size for daily carry. Is that yeah, that's the... pretty much what it's for. Okay. <clears throat> and those handles also were something. I figured it was easier to learn on G10 and wood as opposed to titanium and steel. So, like, those handles are actually done on the CNC router. And then I just finished polishing them out with a belt. And, but yeah, they're, they were completely shaped on the CNC router. Okay. So you, you do the designing on uh, AutoCAD, uh, you, you perfect it. And then you start uh, production of, of these, uh, of your knives. Do you do them in batches or do you do them? Uh, do you have books that you have to fill? I, I don't do a book mainly because I'm terrible at it. And if, if I have to make something, it becomes no fun and I don't want to do it anymore. So I've started to now just make what I want, when I want. And if it sells, I'm good. And if it doesn't, I mean, I'm retired. So I'm, I don't depend on the salary for this. Right. Okay. All right. Well, so if you were, um, when, or I should say, if you, when you were, uh, on the sheriff's department, were you uh, making knives then? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess you were. And were you making them for your fellow uh, sh deputies and such? I mean, I, I, they no, must love mostly I would make them, you know, to like the Blade Show or okay. Blade Show Texas or something like that. Uh, I usually didn't try to sell anything at work. I just, you know. Yeah. Mainly yeah. it was all internet sales and then uh, like show sales. Because I got to say, if I was working with a knife maker, especially those guys, you know, uh, or those guys and gals uh, in uniform, you know, they have a special appreciation for these kind of things. Uh, yeah, it'd be it'd be fun to work alongside a knife maker. Hey, man, uh, if you have any that don't quite fit and you can't quite sell them online, yeah, feel free to bring them in here. So when you're designing them, what are you what are you thinking of? What is your goal? I know you said hard use and beefy, but uh, that's that's not a you know that's just the the packaging. What what is the meaning? I mostly try to do you know something that I like fit for my hands. Um, I don't really have any deep you know meaning for anything that I make and. It's just mainly trying to make whatever I like, you know, and and, and to see if, if, if it works out to be useful, cool. And there's been many a times that I've made something and immediately thrown it in the trash. Ooh. 
you know, uh, that sounded high handed. What is the meaning? What I mean more is like, what are they for? Because I look at your knives and on one hand, I'm like, man, that is pocket candy. And on the other hand, I'm like, I wouldn't mind having that in a fight if I had to be in a knife fight, you know, uh, which, of course, that's just fantasy stuff talk. But uh, to, to, to look at your knives and I've held them twice and I've kind of, uh, you know, poured over them and hefted them. And to me, they they have that sort of. Uh, well, self defense tactical or m muscular feel to them. Um, is is that a part of what goes into them or is, uh, you know, is it a... I think not Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm not big into knife fighting. I, I've taken some classes on it. Like I did some stuff uh, like Steve Tarani's class on karambits mm -hmm. because I wanted to try to to make one at one point and also to just to know how they worked, but no, I'm not, I'm not really big into knife fighting type thing. Uh, when the K bar TDI came out, I don't know if you remember that one. Oh yeah. Still, still around. When that came out, uh, there was, there was kind of conversation in the knife world about uh, gun retention knives is what they called them. And yes. uh, so, is that a gimmick? I I always kind of thought that that was kind of gimmicky. But what is it? Uh, how, did, from your point of view as a law enforcement officer and a knife maker, uh, what do you think of that? There's a lot of people that actually carry those. I mean, specifically for that purpose. Um, I mean, you know, is it going to be used for that? Probably not. It you know, but there there are quite a few people that carry those or like uh, the spider co matriarch but some people carried mm -hmm. that for one um but like i said that's you you've you, maybe you've maybe you've fought over your knife i mean your gun before but usually you never end up ever having to stab anybody over it right right oh man that's uh so th that's all you know theoretical talk to guys like me but to guys like you and the people you served with, uh, those are real considerations, and and something that uh, something that I have to remind myself of, and and sometimes I talk about this on the show is uh, is the need to be sort of aware. You know, it's easy to kind of go down the path of all oh, this. If this happened, I would do that, and if that happened, I would do that. Uh, but to remember that there are legal consequences to what you do. And uh, if you're into it and you consider knives, we're talking about knives here, but if you carry a gun and uh, obviously self-defense is something you're interested in, you should probably get insurance for that. Um, and uh, if I were getting paid, I would plug an insurance company right here, but there are self-defense insurance companies. Uh, as a former officer uh, of the law, I mean, would do you think that that's ha, have you seen um, any uh, repercussions of of people uh, defending themselves um, from the law? Pretty much any it may not maybe not per se criminally, but usually anytime anybody gets stabbed, shot, hit by a car, there's going to be a lawsuit. So, yeah. Insurance for that, which is one thing that I really miss since I retired, is pretty nice to have. So uh, as a retired law enforcement officer, do you walk around? Uh, are you kind of still uh, con uh, on duty? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Do you have that uh, always in? Yeah, you still think about it. You know, when you go in a restaurant, you always want to sit down facing the, you know, facing the door. You don't want to have your back to it. And it's just, it's been beat into you for so long that you can't help yourself. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll go to restaurants and, uh, or, or, you know, I'll go to the post office a lot. Um, cause I send knives around a lot and, uh, you'll see people in line, these long lines at the post office and they're all deep in their phones and I, I get it. It's a horrible, boring place to be in line. Uh, <laughs> But every time I see that, I'm like, okay, I guess, uh, I guess I'm security, <laughs> which is not good. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think with a little more attention, people, people would be uh, would be better off. Well, okay, so I want to find out a little bit about your customers. Um, I know one of them, uh, uh, a uh, 
a, a patron of mine and a and a good friend of the show uh, recently posted uh, something about owning one of your knives, and it's the tear, the one that you that that you held up. And uh, so he's a knife enthusiast. I know that, but who are your customers? Who are the people who are really gravitating towards your work? It's mostly the knife community type crowd. Um, we went to gun shows and tried those and we'll sell a couple, but it's not anything like you would at like a knife show. It's, it's mostly the knife crowd. And, and what is that crowd? Like what, how do you see that crowd? Uh, th there's a lot of overlap between the knife community and the gun community, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the people that are into guns, aren't necessarily going to spend the kind of money. I mean, you know, they may run around with a $3,000 pistol, but then they want like a 1995 knife. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot uh, of overlap, but the knife community is, is, you know, the hardcore knife community is mostly who we try to sell to. You know, so I've seen you at, at two shows. What oh, those things are cool. Those are beautiful. Uh, if you're if you're just listening, Jim just put a uh, Jim just put Will's Instagram page up, and now I'm losing track of my thoughts looking at his knives. But uh, so I've I've seen you at two shows over this past year. I I, I assume like most makers, it's a, a regular part of how you do business. Um, what what have you gotten out of going to these shows? Uh, usually, when I go to a show, all I end up with is a lot of credit card debt because I mean I'll go there and. I see all kinds of stuff I want, you know, <laughs> steel, G10, carbon fiber, uh, titanium screws. Usually, usually that's what I get out of the show. I, I mean, you're stuck at a booth also, so it's not like you get a, a lot of chances to walk around and look at things. Yeah, yeah, but you do have a chance to talk to a lot of people. Oh, uh, yeah, what, yes, what, yes. What's that? What's that like for you? Having people coming up and asking you questions and pawing over your work and then walking <laughs> on and that kind of thing. It's not that bad. I mean, a lot of times you'll have people that'll have some criticism. Some of them are, you know, some of them are not as much valid. Some of them, you know, you're like, oh, I never thought of that. So there, there's been many a time that somebody has said something that it just it never occurred to me before. Things like, uh, have you thought about making this more affordable for me? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's like I had some uh, lady walk up one time and was like, you know, I'd buy one of these if you made a smaller one. So I did, and I actually saw her at the next Blade show, and she bought the first one I'd ever make. That is so cool. That is so cool. What, what kind of uh, things have you gotten, feedback you've gotten, where you're just like, you got the wrong knife maker? You know, everybody comes up, they're like, I want, I'd really like this, but I'd like it thinner. And then you'll start making thinner stuff. And then the next show you'll come back and they're like, I would really like this if it was thicker and beefier. So that's one of the reasons I've kind of got into just, you know, I've, I've kind of like picked my niche and that's what I'm trying to make knives for. That is, that's like the equivalent of, uh, or that's equivalent to an author, um, uh, finding his voice, you know, you hear people say that, like, so that every time they you read one of their books, you're like, this is a different story, but I can tell from the writing, you know, yeah, that that this, you know, who this is, and it's the same thing. Like, you 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 want your work to be recognizable, but at the same time, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. Yeah, uh, like what what how how do you characterize your style? And beyond uh, beyond the format, meaning beyond the beefiness uh, or or the hard use aspect of it, stylistic like like one of the knives we just had up looks kind of Persian. It looks uh, uh, like an investigation in another culture or something. Yeah, Anything and I else? actually do have some completely Persian styled knives, and it's mainly because I really liked them. And if I would have thought about it, I would have dug one out. Um. You know, I, I liked it and I, I tried to make one and it's gone from there. But um, I don't have one here. Show us another knife. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you have some more. Uh, I got a couple. And also <laughs> have like a larger version of the tier. This thing is oh. about, I think it's 11 and a half inches. Damn. That's a beauty. 
That is huge. <laughs> I love it. So uh, uh, um, when you do something like that, something large, for, uh, a larger format uh, knife or a larger size knife of something you've already done, do you uh, scale it up? Is, it, is this just something that gets scaled up or do you have to redesign it to make it fit the size? A lot of it can be just scaled up, but I mean, a lot of things, you know, like, let's say uh, that is like 20% larger than the tier, but then you have to go back in and change like all hole sizes. The geometry usually can stay pretty much the same, but a few things do have to change. When you say the geometry, you're talking about the area uh, like around the, the pivot. Base. Yeah, okay. like the lock to the pivot. So is that something that you can carry from design to design? On some of them, yes, I do. I actually like take the, sometimes I'll take the guts out of one that works really well. And then I'll just pick it up, stick it over in CAD and then go from there. And, and I pretty much have the lock and the pivots all already set up. Like, and then you, uh, can, you can design outward from there. Yeah. Uh, like this is um, another one That's I did. Cool. Yeah. And that internals is about on three different knives. So who are some, oh, oh, the internals on this, uh, yeah, exists, it's an uh, stop pin and everything on the pivot. And all of that was just lifted out of one drawing stuck in the next one. And I went from there. So obviously that's a mechanism that works for you. So to get to that, to get to that spot from starting from scratch and teaching yourself how to make a folder, you know, uh, what, uh, what was that trial and error like? And, and is that a fun part of the creativity or is that just a necessary, uh, like engineering aspect? It's actually a fun part of it. And I, I enjoy that except when I screw up, you know, like you, you'll have a great idea and then you'll, you'll put it out on CAD and then you'll have one cut out and then you'll go back and find out later that it does not work anything like you wanted it to. So, now, if I find one that works really good, it's kind of don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I'll yeah. just take the internals and stick it into the new design. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. First time I heard that concept, it was Jeff Blauvelt of, of tough knives. And, uh, cause I was trying to understand how you, um, how each time you re reinvent the wheel. Cause to me, setting up a flipper, you know, and a detent and all of that. It's, you know, it's like may as well be magic until you learn it, you know? And, uh, and he's like, yeah, if you just kind of build around that part of it and it makes total sense. And it's, it, it, it doesn't in any way seem limiting to what you can design. Yeah. I mean, like the, like the internal stop pin, it, if you, if you have one in a knife that works, it, it's it's not going to change that much from one knife to the next. I mean, you know, there's certain parts that, that you really don't need to change. So from what you're seeing from your peers uh, in the custom knife world, um, custom folding knife world, what are what are some of the uh, emerging trends that you're you're seeing? Um, CNC. And CNC. Yeah, there's a lot of CNC, which I don't have anything against it as long as you actually tell a person that that's what it is. Because I actually have some CNC done knives. But So there is a category now at Blade Show, and it's best. I, I'm going to try and remember this. It's like best machine made custom. That's what it is. Best yeah, machine made custom. Like um, and I think that that's an interesting distinction at, because up until I saw that award category just this past year, um, I kind of didn't pay any attention to, um, people saying, oh, I do this all entirely by hand. Not that I didn't pay attention to it. I have massive respect for, um, anyone who's doing any of this, uh, making knives in, in any way, as long as they're good knives, massive respect. But, uh, uh, the machine made uh, as opposed to the handmade is something that has become bifurcated. And um, it's interesting to me. Do you think it's worth that conversation or that division? Uh, or, or, or do you think a knife is a knife? 
I'm pretty much along the knife as a knife, as long as the customer knows what they're getting, you know, you know, if, if you actually made it cool, if you had it made somewhere else, you know, as long as you don't lie to them and tell them where it came from or and who made it, it's the same with CNC. As long as the customer knows what they're getting, I don't have a problem with it. Yes. Yes. Okay. I was thinking of just the, the maker who has their own CNC, but you're talking also about OEM stuff. Yeah. Uh, right. Like, have, so this is interesting to me because <clears throat> I'm always uh, curious to find out if someone such as yourself who makes every folder in house, I mean, you, you, you'll have stuff water jetted, whatever, but, but the point is you make all your knives. Uh, they all go through your hands, correct? Yeah. I've had some that were, CNC by a, a friend who had who's much better at it than I am, and I had him do some frames of a different style knife just because I couldn't I couldn't figure out the tool pass to do it. So I had him do them, and 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 I've never you know anybody that's ever asked, I've always told him. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you are uh, in my eyes kind of a purist. You you make all the knives, uh, but at at a certain point maybe purist isn't the right term, but maybe at a certain point uh, to sell more knives, uh, like many knife makers, you you decide to uh, OEM, have someone else build it for you, uh, a knife that you can have in production that you can sell and kind of have working on the side. Um, how, how does that sit with you? Um, because, well, I'm just curious, how does that sit with you? It, it doesn't bother me. In fact, I've actually have some that are being done right now that'll probably be maybe be done for the Texas Blade Show, and it, they'll it'll be different. Like the logo will be different, so there will be no question that you know it's not handmade. It's it's not hand ground. It's going to be a complete OEM, and and they'll have they'll have a completely different logo and everything. Okay, so that's really good. I love hearing that as, uh, from from Maker. So I have a lot of knives, and I want a lot more. And I don't have, uh, you know, custom custom knife budget, uh, pretty much. Uh, and so when I hear that makers that I like have uh, OEMs coming out, like like Keenison, for instance, down there in Texas, just recently had his first OEM knife came out and uh, come out, and I was so excited about that because it brings design within reach uh, to people who, who really want it, uh, but don't necessarily uh, have the, the resources at the moment. So uh, at, that's really exciting. What was it like working uh, with the OEM? It was actually not bad because I already had everything in CAD pretty much. So I just sent it to them and said, hey, this is what I want. And it and to cut down on you know the, the cost of it, I didn't try to do anything it's pretty much going to be chamfered edges, flat scales. I may do pockets in some of them for like an inlay, but it just, just to cut down on the overall costs of it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, but that would be sticking with a big part of your aesthetic. A lot of your uh, knives are uh, a lot of your titanium frame lock folders, just in case anyone's uh, uh, listening and not seeing are, um, well, they do have a plane for a lot of them, like the ones yeah. that were just showing up, uh, not very intricate inlays and stuff like that. I mean, they're perfect canvases for that, but I don't think anyone buying an, uh, one of your production knives would be missing. Oh, this is, you know, where are the inlays? Um, so I think that that's a great, that's a great uh, recipe. And um, are you divulging uh, who the OEM is? Or is that something you're keeping under wraps? It, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me. Uh, Universal Outfitters. Are they American? Are they in yeah, the state? They're, they're going to be. That's that's one thing I, I wanted and I specified with him is, as long as everything is from the U.S., the screws, the pivots, everything is going to be from the U.S. So. Okay. Uh, so you said Universal. Universal. Universal Outfitters. Outfitters. That is really cool, and that's great to hear. I I'm a big fan of some of the uh, Chinese OEMs, but uh, the, the, the conversation that has begun and hasn't stopped, uh, at least on this show, is how do we make them here? And yeah. uh, it seems like more and more I'm hearing people making it work. Um, I know, like, uh, in terms of volume, it'll be a long time, if ever, before we can kind of manage that. 
but uh, to, I mean, we got a lot of manufacturing. We got a lot of knife people. We got a lot of machinists. We got a lot of shops in this country uh, should be able to make it work. Oh, and yeah. uh, so that's exciting. So uh, when you, when you do this or when you did this and, and had your first um, OEM project, it, did you decide on a number uh, of knives to make due to what you might expect the demand to be, or do you have a stockpile? How does that work? On, on the, there's two things on that. At one time, Camillus did actually make some of my knives. Uh, oh. They made one, uh, the Jolt. That was one that I designed for. Them. Um, on, on these, it, it's kind of testing the waters. I'm, I'm only having him do 100, mainly because... I may end up with a hundred afterwards. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's kind of like testing the waters. If it works out, then I'll probably put in another order for more. But I did a hundred to like see how it, see what the market, you know, even if they were even interested. And is this going to be a um, uh, a pre-order kind of situation? No, I'm, I'm like that's getting back to books. I'm terrible at it. Uh, honestly, uh, it's probably going to go to like one of the dealers, like, uh, USA made blade. I think oh, okay. I talked to him and he is interested in possibly taking some or all. Well, that'd be cool. That'd be great. Yeah. That's kind of the, uh, I hear you unless you have a, a real mind for it and an interest and love for being fa fastidious about those kind of details. I'm, I'm terrible at it have a dealer take care of it man that's that's what they do you know um so I, I know that you said that you don't rely on the knife making uh to to make ends meet but what have your impressions of the knife world as a business or you know what what is it like running a small business in folding knives it's actually pretty tough. I, and I would really feel bad for anybody that tries to make a living at it. I mean, some people do and they do really well, but for the most part, most people probably don't. I, my, my uh, revenue pretty much is, is my tool budget. It gives me a chance to go out and buy new toys. Well, so what is it uh, about it? Why, why would you say that? Well, it's just, I, like I said, but I, I don't depend on it. And I usually just, I, I do it just for the, to make money to buy new tools. And that's pretty I, much what all my revenue is used for. No, no, no. I got that part. I'm sorry. What I meant was, um, uh, what, why do you say you kind of feel bad for people who want to make a go at it? Like what part of, I mean, I, I know, I, I, I can't imagine how hard it must be, but what it, what is, is it demand? Is it, is it the fact that there are so many knife makers? Uh, it, it's just kind of hard, you know, like uh, somebody was actually at one of the last shows was telling that joke about how to make a million dollars as a knife maker, start with two. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it, it's, 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 it's a really rough gig to try to make a living on. I mean, there are some people that do really good at it and there's some that don't. Yeah. Well, in a way, uh, it's like being an artist. Uh, even though you're not making art, you're making uh, tools. Uh, they can be very art artistically uh, uh, rendered and designed and all that. Uh, but it's the similar kind of thing. Like if if people don't want a painting, especially a painting for five thousand bucks, they're not going to buy your painting. You're going to be a starving artist. That doesn't mean your painting's bad. Uh, no, but it's also like most of them. You know, when they're starting out you're not going to have health insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, if something goes wrong, you know, you're out of look like right now, I'm just getting back into making again because I'm recovering from nerve damage in my right hand. Oof. So yeah, the, the first month, it was pretty much like that. It's, it stayed that way for like a month, month and a half. Mm. And right now I'm finally to the point where I can make stuff again, but it's still not there. And I mean, if, if you know you get hurt and you don't have some other kind of supplemental income, it can be pretty rough on you. Yeah, and and you know, I'm sure from your your past career too, you know something about repetitive stress damage to the body. And um, I, 
again, I don't know. I'm not a knife maker, but I would imagine that hours of solitude in front of a grinder, uh, yeah. you know, keeping your body stiff and, you know, you've got a mask on, but maybe you're breathing in some, uh, if you're not careful, it could become an unhealthy situation, you know, I would imagine like any oh, yeah. job like that. Nothing's really, nothing in the knife industry is really good. I mean, you know, the titanium dust, steel dust, carbon fiber, none of it's really good. And, and like I said, and a lot of the guys don't even have health insurance. I mean, I still do because I was able to continue it from my, um, my old job. I mean, I just had to pay the, the same premium every month, but I mean, a lot of these guys don't even have insurance. So if anything happens, yeah. You know, they're in a world of hurt. Yeah, especially with buffing wheels. Those things scare the hell out of me, man. Those things are vicious. Uh, you know, they had the one guy that got a, I think it was a bolster caught on it, and hit him in the chest, and he ended up being hospitalized with a blood clot years ago. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, no. those, are, those are pretty dangerous. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard of those grabbing knives and kind of launching them into walls and everything. Yeah. I've had it grab uh, like bolsters and, and pocket clips and all, but you know, I, mine has all the little cages around it to keep it from coming back. But yeah, if you don't, it, it launches it at a good clip. So what about the process is your favorite part? You know, you, you've, you, you're starting from scratch uh, before you even have a design like soup to nuts. What part do you like the best? I really like the CAD part of it, honestly. Um, in fact, I've probably got sh somewhere in a range of about a hundred knife designs on my computer. Mm -hmm. Most of them were never even made just because I just can't help myself. I'll sit there and I'll do another one and I'll do another one just because I'll, I, I enjoy it. Is that it's where good. the, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it, it, the software is a whole lot like what we we use at my ex employment because we did scale diagrams wow. on fatality. So I've been using kind of drafting equipment, CAD equipment for a long time. So it's kind of familiar, and I enjoy it. So is there a a parallel uh, between uh, besides the software uh, aspect? Is there a, pa a parallel between what you were doing in your former career? Uh, in terms of process with how you make knives? Uh, probably not as much. I mean, you know, at the, at the sheriff's office, we were all just trying to, to, to grab, get all the evidence together, figure out what had occurred. And, you know, like you'd mentioned, solving a puzzle, to find out what, who was responsible and what happened with the knife. To me, it's, it's more of a, really expensive hobby. If I didn't do this, I mean, I'd probably be doing something like sitting around the house, drinking bourbon all day. <laughs> well, that sounds fun. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Knives making knives more productive. You can buy more bourbon uh, with, <laughs> with the money you make. Um, so uh, you showed the knuckle duster knife. Uh, if you don't mind pulling that up again, just so we can take a sure. look at it. And, and so this is a knife that's a little bit outside of what you do normally. What, what inspired this knife? And then, and then tell me what, what your, what your dream build is, what your, what your, if you were able to take your flight of fancy wherever, what, what you would build. Uh, probably the next thing I'm playing with doing is actually a switchblade. That's, that was what I would like to do soon. I just haven't got the time to mess with it yet so what would that entail uh uh taking one of your folders and figuring it'll, out it'll how probably to... be completely from from scratch because you know the the internals of it will be different yeah um it, and it'll probably be a lot of it cut out on cnc just because you know spotting and drilling it by hand you're not going to be accurate enough so that'll probably be done on a cnc so who's whose knives because now i'm trying to figure out what this switch blade would look like and who knows until you design it but but it, it makes me wonder whose knives inspire you and uh and uh you know whose work do you really admire out there uh 
Les George makes gorgeous stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, I really, really like his stuff. Um, I like a lot of the Strider things. I'm not really big into the nightmare grinds and all, but I really like the Strider AR was my favorite knife. Mm. I carried it at work for years. So, yeah, that I, I did the Emerson's, but I was more into the bigger knives. But like my favorite will probably be Les George. Les George. Yeah, I I'm with you on on Les George. He's one of my favorite makers. He's, he's definitely a really nice guy. And he is a very nice and pretty funny guy, too. I just did a show on my uh, 10 favorite designer slash makers, and he was on that list. Um, yeah. uh, you know, everything from the VSEP and uh, the rock eye and all of the all of his custom folders to his stuff we were talking about before we rolled here his knuckle dusters uh, 1918 knuckle dusters and then the collaborations he's yeah. done where he's had other people make the blades and he casts those the dusters it's yeah he does some he does some great stuff um and i can kind of see uh it, when when you mentioned strider i can kind of not see uh not seeing inspiration, but I could, I would put them on the same shelf if they were both in my collection because they're, they're both incredibly uh, robust. And they also, they're also like nice. They're, they're, they're uh, easy on the eyes. They look strong as hell. And they're coming out of a place from a person who's been there. Um, and to me, that means something. Yeah. And a lot of things I like about some of those knives also like, mine or the striders is basically it's like i don't really want anything that's really fancy and gorgeous because i'm gonna screw it up i'm i'm gonna pry something up with it or or jab it into something i shouldn't just because i can't help myself not even intentionally it's just i'm it's in my hand i'm gonna use yeah. it yeah yeah for me it's like the more fine the point the more likely i am to drop it on my uh cement floor down here in the basement you know oh, that happens a lot too <laughs> it's just how it is um so uh as we wrap here uh you mentioned earlier uh, uh some of the hardships of um knife making and starting a knife making business and and we all kind of get that but what would you say to someone starting off what are what is the great reward of knife making that might be, um, you know, worth the squeeze, so to speak? It's just fun. It's rewarding to, to, you know, to be able to take a piece of plate steel and, and, and to make something out of it that's useful and that you like, and then you may want to show people. It, to me, that's, that's most of it. It's just the reward of that. That's uh, I, I, like I said, I don't make knives, but I can understand that. And the work that you do, uh, you know, is going to, uh, you know, live way beyond us. Um, and there's got to be some satisfaction in that. Yes. Will Zermino of Zermino Knives, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. It's been a pleasure uh, talking with you, especially after meeting you twice and uh, and finding out about your work. Thank you, sir. Thank you much, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Will Zermino of Zermino Knives. In 2022, he won Best Tactical Folder at Blade Show 2022 from the Knife Makers Guild. And uh, I have hefted his hand, uh, hefted his uh, knives in these very hands, and they are super cool. Uh, so do check them out and check them out on Instagram uh, at Zermino Knives. All right, that just about does it for this show. Uh, be sure to check us out on Thursday Night Knives and Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.